We have to remember that kids in these situations are victims of domestic violence themselves. They are being emotionally manipulated. They can appear like little narcissists and it is really scary, but you have to remember that they're doing what's called fawning. They're trying to figure out a way to survive. We can separate from that person and live in our own place and get away from them, but the kids are the ones who still have to go back and forth. Welcome to another episode of Negotiate Your Best Life. I am so excited today to welcome my friends, Chris and Lisa from Been There, Got Out. And they have a really, really interesting story. You know, it's always that out of your pain comes purpose, right? So Chris and Lisa actually met through their own pain and then they ended up founding Ben There Got Out. They both went through high conflict divorces of their own. And so that's why they say Ben There Got Out because they, they've been there and they got out. And so they are now both high, con high, high conflict divorce strategists and they have co-written their own book about being there and getting out. It's called Ben There Got Out, Toxic Relationships and high conflict divorce and how to stay sane under insane circumstances, which was published in March of 2023. And they now work together to help people and in these crazy situations. And they are really, really, really terrific people. And they both had their own backgrounds. One was in tech, and, you know, Chris was in tech. And they're really, really su super smart people. But I'm just going to let them tell their stories and uh, tell how they ended up getting together and doing this amazing work that they're doing now. So thank you guys for being here. And thank you for sharing your stories and sharing and doing the things that you're doing. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. It's our pleasure to be back yeah. with you, Rebecca. Yeah, we've been on you for a while now. So, so, so glad to be collaborating again. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I want you guys to just start off by, you know, whichever one of you wants to jump in and talk first, I want you to share your own stories because I think people, especially in my community, I have a lot of people who follow me and listen and listen to the podcast and, and will be watching this on YouTube as well, who are going, got out but wait a minute, I'm still in, or I, I'm still like dealing. I'm still trying to survive over here. And I want to hear, wait a minute, did they actually go through what I'm going through now? Or was it really as bad as what I'm going through? Because I think what I'm going through is way worse than what they could have ever gone through. So I want you guys to tell your story because for those people who are going, yeah, but yeah, but mine's so much worse, or I I could never, please tell your story so that they can hear and have hope and know that it, they really can. You really can turn it around no matter where you are. Where I always say wherever you are is just the jumping off point. You really can win. I always say they only win if you give in, right? So no matter where you are, you absolutely can turn it around. So whichever one of you wants to jump in and start, I would love for you to share your story. Sure. So um, I'm just so somebody goes first. Um, I was with my ex for about 14 years in total, married for 10. We have two kids. It was um, a very, very stormy, challenging, difficult relationship almost from the start um, my divorce, which began in 2014, took three years and cost me $300,000 for like no no good reason. We ended up at the end uh, pretty much where we started um, with some minor, minor details that switched. And what really changed things, um, and this By was a big way, part. I just want to say, as an attorney, I have seen that happen so many times times. And I just tell people often, some people just need to be beat up by the process, right? They just don't believe you at the beginning that that's where you're going to end up because some people just have these like ridiculous things that they're going to go and 
the judge is going to hear their story and the heavens are going to open up and, and it's all going to be like, oh my God, I can't believe that that's what you had to deal with. And, and they think that it's all going to go and it's like a certain way or whatever, right? And because they are hmm, narcissists, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah. And there, so, and the system feeds into it too, because you have the psychological profiles, you have all those, the evaluators and all those people, Lisa always calls it a, a feeding frenzy. And you're a hundred percent right. When, um, when we'll do discovery calls with people who set appointments with us and we start talking a lot of times, they'll say, my situation is so crazy. And Lisa and I are like, okay, go ahead. Like we've, we've heard it all. We've lived it all <laughs> and all that, but um, really where our coaching practice, our book, the whole thing came from was a conversation. It was, uh, I had just met Lisa. I met Lisa while, while I was um, in the earlier stages, first year of my divorce. And, um, and, and I said to her, you know, we, we had learned so much. And if I could go back in time and redo everything, I could easily save half that money, half that time, who knows how much emotional turmoil and fear and like my role as a dad and all that stuff. I mean, that was a horrific experience. And we said, well, it's, you know, there's no time machine. You can't go back and fix what I did wrong. But we had learned at that point, how many people are facing these problems are just getting chewed up in the system, suffering from legal abuse and all that. So we can't undo or redo our own uh, situations, but we can help others with it. And that's where, that's where, where this all started. And it started as a book project. And then that kind of got put on hold because somebody, a very, very wise um, a literary agent said, you should get into, do coaching, do the book, but use the book to promote the coaching. And so we got into coaching and that just took off. And we, even we underestimated how big a need there was for this kind of, this kind of support and this, the strategist role that we play um, to sort of work along with the therapists and the attorneys and all the other professionals who are involved because the cases are so crazy. Mm, very wise advice. And I, you know, I, I heard a, a saying one time, you are best served to help the people with it, the person that you used to be. Exactly. Yeah. yeah right. And so I, I think that was a very, uh, whoever that was, was a wise person. And it's always out of your trauma becomes your transformation. And, and, and it's so, it's so wonderful when you can look in the eyes of a person and go, Oh, I see you. I know you, I see your pain, but I know it. I know that pain. Right. And, 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 and then have that person feel like, Oh my God, that person does know me. The person does understand. And yeah. The one, the one we love is, um, uh, turn your mess into your message. Yeah. And we get that a lot. A lot of people reach out to us and they'll say, well, I want to write a book or I want to, I want my story heard. Mm -hmm. I want to get into advocacy and all of that. And it's sure. great. It's wonderful. It's well-intentioned. But what Lisa and I will say to them is let, let others carry the torches and pitchforks for now. Go win your case. That's the best thing you can do. And if you want to get into advocacy later, like we're a hundred percent behind you. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So, and, and you had, how old were your children when you first started in, in your divorce? Two, two boys, 10 and seven. 10 and seven. And so yep, they had at to the time. go through all of that with you. And, and they're 20 and 17 now. And as Lisa mentioned earlier, our, our situations are very, very different. She can touch on that a little bit, but I co-parent, I share about 50, 50 custody. Obviously my older one, he's in college, he's aged out. And I have less than a year left in terms of like the custody part of it um, with my younger one. But it was a, it's been like the back and forth every week and all that, a lot of involvement, a lot of uh, engagement and having to enforce boundaries and things like that. But Lisa's story is very different. So are you able to co-parent peacefully? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's it's been um, I always use the analogy of. Um, like picture a, a, a rancher who has a thousand acres that is cattle roam every day. And he has to ride the perimeter fence every single day because overnight somebody's cut the fence, somebody's broken broken in. Narcissists hate boundaries. Mm. 
Mm -hmm. and mine is no exception. She's always finding some new way in. I've, I mean, it's 10 years later at this point. So I've, I've basically repaired the, I've replaced the fence with like a 10 foot brick wall. <laughs> so it's a yeah. lot more, my boundaries are a lot better today, but it was all this like, oh my God, she found this other way to interfere with my parenting time or cause chaos. When Lisa and I first got together uh, as a romantic couple, which nobody wants to hear about right now, um, she, her comment to me was, you're not emotionally available because anytime my ex would say, you know, it's, it's nine 30 on a Tuesday evening and we're sitting holding hands on the wall by her house. And, and, and she's, uh, my ex will say like, our son needs his medication. You have to come over right now. And I, I would be like jumping, like I better, you know, you walk on eggshells in the relationship, you walk on eggshells to make sure you don't go, don't get in trouble even after the divorce. Oh, I know. I know. I mean, I told you this before we went on the air when, when we had our pre-call that I have a family member who it took him six years to get through his divorce. But, you know, he would say, you know, if it was a 6 p.m. drop off that he would wait around the corner to drop off right at the dot of 6 p.m. because if he dropped off late he was a deadbeat and early he was a stalker. So <laughs> it was like right on the dot of 6 p.m., you know, but that was kind of part of the conditioning because he was, oh my God, I don't want to have to hear about it. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. So let's hear from you now, Lisa. Okay. Yeah. So I had a very different experience. I was with my ex for about 20 years, married for about 18. And, um, we didn't fight a lot. It seemed very calm and peaceful. And then I found out that he was living a double life the entire time. And so when things started to come out, it was like, oh my God. And we went through couples counseling. I, my biggest fear was, um, how this would affect the kids. And I felt like if I divorced him, that I would be breaking up the family and ruining their lives. And that was used to keep me in the relationship, even though it just got worse and worse. And at some point it got more painful to stay than to go. And it, it took about two years of planning. Um, and then when we finally decided, I thought, okay, this is going to be really amicable because we've had two years we've tried and clearly it's, it's not working. So when I filed papers, I met, I, I had my first consult. I immediately knew the attorney and I were a, a match, but he said, yours is going to be really bad. And I was like, how do you know this? And of course I interviewed him for the book later, but in 20 minutes, the, the things I was describing were in my head. I thought, well, my ex is a good guy. He's just done some bad things. My attorney, Eric was like, no, 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 these, this signals high conflict divorce, which of course, who, who would know? So, and in our book, we have a whole chapter about some of those factors that indicate a high conflict divorce. And Eric was totally right. In my state of Connecticut, when you file, they set a trial date for a year from that point. So there's a deadline. We went right up until two weeks beforehand. And my divorce also cost a hundred thousand dollars, which was insane when I thought, oh my gosh, I don't have $10,000, so I can't leave. And now I'm going to be paying these debts back for, for life. But anyway, um, so I thought we would, you know, have this amicable situation. I was looking forward to having some weekends to myself. I have two kids at the time. They were, I think, 11 and 14 ish. And um, but my ex just walked out on. He said, he said, if you if you divorce me, I'm not going to pay for the kids college. And this was something that was very important to me. And I thought to our family, I'm an educator. I'm my background is in teaching. And I just was like, how, how would you, how dare you do something like that? You know, that's not harming me. That's harming the kids. Um, and when he left, he basically left all of us. He said, uh, he gave my son his library card and his YMCA card and threw it on the table and said, I guess I'm done with this. I don't need this anymore. And I was like, wow, like, wow. So he left and just that was it. And then he kind of came back. He was doing, you know, you can imagine what kinds of behaviors these people have. And they're thinking about themselves and what makes them happy and et cetera. And, um, and I got immediately got my kids into therapy and then by the time my ex was ready, you know, had his had his little fun and it didn't work out and he wanted to sort of um, 
re-engage with the kids. They were fed up and their therapists were involved and he was unwilling to really uh, commit to uh, therapy with them. How long, and how long was that in between? Uh, it was about nine months. And then uh, we tried, we tried after a year. I mean, I wished that he was there because I wanted a break. I was like, I didn't want to be a sole parent. I kept thinking like, how come he doesn't want to take the kids? Like I, I couldn't understand. Um, you know, I knew he was like dating and doing all his things, but I just kept thinking, what, what about the kids? Like, I thought he valued our, our children and our family. So I was astonished and um, it was really well, hard. We used to, sorry. We used to talk about this all the time when we were in the early years of our relationship, which was like, you know, who has it worse? Right. I, I have I have my kids half the time, approximately. I have to be engaged with this toxic ex and we'll say co-parent. It's not really co-parenting, um, but I get a break. Right. Because um, half the time they're with her. Lisa um, doesn't have to deal with any of the I mean, in court, yes. But as a in terms of co-parenting, doesn't have to deal with her ex. But she's a full time single mom, like all the time. She never gets a break. Right. So, so as we call it, this is a sole parent. Plus you had to deal with the fact that he just abandoned all of you. And well, the, the kids, I mean, I didn't feel abandoned, but the kids, I was just like, how, how could you just not consider the kids at all? He moved in with his father. There were no overnights. There were no requests for visit. We did mediation. We came up with a parenting plan and he had all these days. He just never, he just never came. I so the hardest- it. So amazing. That's I know. so incredible. I can't yeah. even imagine. That's I know. The hardest part for me was dealing with the emotional fallout for the kids. Yeah, that's and what I mean. That's I couldn't, I didn't know crazy. how to explain somebody who had been physically present their whole lives, who just was like, I'm, I'm done. So um, anyway, you know, the divorce took forever and I kept thinking like, this is crazy. And then it's now been this is the beginning of the decade, year 10. And I have been in court with him mainly because he does not comply with the agreement. And, um, you know, it was an agreement. We didn't have to go to trial for that, for the divorce itself. We've been to trial a lot since then. But I figured since I can't force him to be a parent to these children, the least I can do is make sure he honors his financial obligation to them. And so that's what I've been doing is making sure that he did in fact contribute to their college education, that he did pay child support and alimony, which he decided he didn't feel like paying even though he had agreed to it. And that's what all these years in court have really been about is trying to make sure that that agreement is followed. And um, I always say that it took a long time for justice to be served. And we always know that people in these situations feel like they get away, how do they get away with this stuff for so long? He got away with stuff for a long time and then it hit him really, really hard. And I think he had attorneys that were um, enabling him and saying, oh, you know, we're going to wear her down. She's going to get tired of it. She's by herself could because I didn't have an attorney representing me for, for the majority of this. Um, and they were just really wrong. And And it's just so sad because in this process of him, I feel like... Um, financially abusing the kids to get to me he's he's destroyed his relationship and he doesn't seem to understand that like he was punishing the kids like I've moved on with my life I was at peace when we got the divorce and um it's just really hard to fathom you know sometimes we wonder what's in these people's heads but then we remember they have they have some issues so it's hard we can't project our own values onto them so anyway in a nutshell a big nutshell. That's my situation. Wow. Wow. So, so interesting and both so sad. I mean, because, in it, you know, it just demonstrates how in, in two different, completely different ways, how narcissists will always put themselves first, even before their children. Yeah. Yeah. And so many people like Lisa touched on um, how long it took the stamina she had to have to make it through that legal process so that justice could be served. Eventually, I cannot tell you how many times I sat in one of those little conference, tiny conference rooms while she went into court and we're thinking today's the day. They're going to finally see it. It's finally going to happen today. And she'd come out 
with her head hung low, shaking her head. I was, oh my gosh. Like how, how, how did this happen? How did he still how, like get to delay it again or stretch things out? And like Lisa said, their goal is to wear you down and bleed you dry financially, figuring that you'll, you'll give up. Oh, I remember. People do. So yeah, I, I remember a particularly astonishing thing um, while we were in court trying to figure out the educational support order. So the college, how we were going to do the college. And we had we, it took a year and about eight court appearances to, for me to get that educational support order. And so my son had started college at a private university. And so um, my ex was supposed to reimburse me his share and he just didn't. And so I went back to court and said, he's he's not paying. If he doesn't pay his share, then our son has to drop out of this school because I can't afford to, to keep him in a private college. And we already have this order. And the judge said repeatedly to my ex, sir, if you don't pay, if you don't pay back, do you understand that your son is going to have to drop out of college? And it happened like it. He allowed it to happen. The court didn't force you know, the penalties in time. And my son had to leave that college. And luckily he was able to transfer to a state school, but it was just like, people think that, you know, what matters to normal parents, like, look, if you don't do this, your son's going to drop out. But with a narcissist or someone like that, they're glad they're like, oh, I can control that. I can punish my son and therefore harm my ex-wife. Let it happen. And it happened. And I think over the years, we we did have several judges, but there was one judge that was on the case. And I think they just sort of were shaking their heads like, what kind of parent does this? And we always think about child's best interest, which doesn't even relate to college. But like, what kind of parent behaves like this to their own children? Mm. Yes. So it goes back to what I constantly say. And I, I always tell people that there's a hierarchy to narcissistic supply which is that diamond level versus coal level. And if, you know, people always say narcissists just want to win. They just want to win. But that's not true. Winning is only image related. And that coal level supply is that manipulation, the manipulation. And they want both. They want to win. They want the image, but they also want the manipulation. And, and so I always tell people, you have to create that leverage, which is going to threaten that, that image threaten that source of supply that's more important for them to keep than the supply that they get from manipulating you. And that's the only way that you will get them to stop. Because if you don't do that, then they will never leave you alone. They will never leave you alone. Because clearly you're seeing what's going on here, right? They don't care about children. They only care about their image. They only care about their image. And, and so, and, you know, in your case, I guess, judge was not the, the image that they cared about. So you got to figure out where's the image. Sometimes judges, it, it is a good source of supply for them, right? They don't want to look bad in front of a judge, but if that's not the source of supply that they care about, then you got to figure out what that is and create leverage around that. Right. So, um, so going back to this, you know, and I want to just create some do's and don'ts here for people who are trying to co-parent or counter-parent, whatever it is, with a toxic ex. You know, early on in the in their situation, some do's and don'ts, I would say, and I think you guys would agree, don't believe them when they say, oh, I just want to settle this amicably. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah <laughs> how that about the one big... of like yeah oh we don't we don't need lawyers like yeah. let's we need to save money so yeah. let's just do it ourselves but you yeah. know what i have this is really easy yeah. let's just you sign that you don't need to see anything just let's agree and we'll right be or we just need we don't need a specific agreement we'll just put this in here we just we're both gonna get half the time right we don't need a, a specific agreement, right? Yeah, that that was a big part of like when my, and by the way, my ex left me, not the other way around, which thank goodness, it was the greatest thing she ever did for me because I would never have left that relationship. I don't think, um, and it's, a, I always 
talk about how resilience is a wonderful trait, but in overabundance, it keeps you in these horrific relationships. But when she did leave, she talked about it as if we'll have dinner at each other's houses. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. It'll, it'll be just like when we were together, except we, we won't be. And, and oddly, um, and I didn't figure this out really until later, when she left me, she didn't file for divorce. She filed for custody only. And it wasn't until almost a year later that I was like, this is ridiculous. Like I, we're getting divorced, right? So I filed for divorce, which is, that was a whole other, just oh, add to all the yeah. expense, just chaos. It was that's a another chaos. big do's and don'ts thing is not to do the divorce in parts. Mm. Uh, that's another thing that I see a big mistake on. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just was did a, a, a call with somebody on this. They did, they, um, they had already done the divorce. They were already divorced. And, 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 and now they had already done the, um, like they'd already given the house to the person. And, and now that the only thing left was like the custody piece and and so they had no leverage left mm. had no leverage right. left because the person was already moved in with their new supply they had everything they already wanted sure so you, got, you got to you, hold you it just, back you just hit on two you're talking about mistakes right yeah um, one is is a lot of people come to us and uh, like with me with me it wasn't about money it was about custody. It was about my role as a dad. Um, and so we see so many people who say, I'll, I'll give, I'll give on the financial side. I just want custody. I want favorable custody terms. And then, so they settle, right. And they get reasonably good custody terms and they give up everything financially. And then guess what? Two years later, the other party goes back and looks for a modification to custody and gets 50, 50 anyway. So that's that's one we see, and then the other you already touched on is um, is underestimating your ex and what they're capable of, mm -hmm. and thinking, well, it didn't work out. Like approaching it like a normal divorce, where there's a trajectory of, yeah, they're pissed off. There's resent. There's a, some resentment there. There's something tore a marriage apart that wasn't intended to be torn apart. But reasonable people on a normal divorce trajectory calm down after six months, nine months, 12 months, maybe a little longer when the bills start piling up and they've calmed down, they've, they've, um, they've moved on in some ways and they're like, okay, this is ridiculous. Let's put the kids first and they work through it and it can be okay. Um, in these situations, my, it just ramps up and up and up. And for a long time, like mine got worse and worse and worse for years, even after the divorce was over. Yes, that's so true. That's such a good point. That's such a good point. The other thing also about narcissists is that you think um, that if you give something, like it's it just something that you just said that made me think of it, like, oh, I'll give the financials and then they'll see how good I am and they'll see how giving I've been and then they'll give on this other thing. They're not, they don't see that. They'll, they just take, they just go, well, I, I was entitled to that anyway. That was right. mine. Right. Well, the moving goalposts, right? I, but, well, I made all that money. That right. was my money. So right. um, you didn't give me anything. Right. I, I, I love the quote. Um, what's mine is mine. And what's yours is mine too. Yes. And yeah. it makes me think back of when, when I was still with my ex. Um, I mean, I had been a teacher, but then I became a stay at home mom for a while and I still was working, but I had these entrepreneurial situations. So he had the steady job with the 401k. So he's like, let's just start socking money into my retirement and use your money to pay the household bills. And my retirement was going to be our retirement because I'm going to share it. Well, you know what happened? Like my money's gone. And then he's got this huge retirement. And then for the settlement, it's like, no, he keeps his retirement. Right. And so even if you had said, oh, you know, keep your retirement. And I just one time with the kids, he would have been like, well, it was my retirement anyway. Yeah, he was. So <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> 
Exactly. As well oh, as his like, 14 rental properties that was like, oh no, those are mine. Those are mine too. Yeah. Even, even if the law provided that you got half of it, mm-hmm. right. They wouldn't see like, oh, that you were being so giving, so kind. And then there you would have given away your leverage. Yeah. So right. they, they're not, so don't do that. Don't do that early on. And and especially when you have those, oh, we don't need lawyer conversations that early on at the beginning. Oh, let's just settle this amicably. And And even if you have one of those conversations sort of casually, they'll try to hold you to it. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And you you talk, I mean, your your book goes way in depth on the negotiation side. We always tell our people like you, you never ever give anything of value without getting something of value in return. Right. My one, by the way, my one criticism of your book is that you didn't write it 10 years earlier when it could have made a difference. In, in, oh, you're funny. Yeah. In, oh, in my divorce, because it's yeah. time machine stuff. Yeah. So, um, so let's talk um, more about, um, you know, trying to deal with a, a, a toxic ex. And um, I know, Chris, you're still in it a bit too. And, you know, for people who now it's after the final judgment and they are, you know, and I see this all the time too, you know, there's not everything can be written in there. Not everything can be written in there. And they are feeling like they're still getting away with it. They're still constantly finding those cracks, finding those crevices, finding those ways to get away with something, finding those ways to make your life miserable in, in, in some way, you know, whether it's um, not paying for a certain thing or not allowing um, the children to come to the birthday party or not, you know, whatever it is, um, what would you say to them? Well, I mean, if it's too late, I mean, one of the things we try to encourage our people to do, our community and our clients, is if you have a parenting plan, you need to make sure it is as detailed as possible and think through, especially if you have little kids, think through their entire childhoods all the way up to 18, right? Um, If you have gray language in there, any, I I always say the devil's in in the details. I even have a, a little slide I show for that. Um, They will take advantage of any gray language, any ambiguity at all to torture you with it. Um, Deadlines, consequences, you need those things in there. Not um, you get Thanksgiving in odd years and I get Thanksgiving in even years, but Thanksgiving begins Wednesday at 3 p.m. or or, or Wednesday after school or 3 p.m. if there's no school right? Like every little thing needs to be said in in great detail. And even then there are things um, people put in clauses like uh, right of first refusal, right? And think, oh, good. Well, he's always leaving the kids with the girlfriend. So if I put a right of first refusal in there, um, that'll that'll take care of that situation. Well, no, guess what? Guess how enforceable those those things are. It's very, very hard. Courts don't want to hear it. They, they're, they like, they don't want you there. Yeah. And the word reasonable. <laughs> because well, yeah. What they unless it's fluff. What they definitely don't want to hear, what I call aspirational, is like oh, the parent is not supposed to talk badly about the other parent or something like that. I mean, that's just all aspirational because how are you supposed to really enforce that? I mean, are you going to really go running back to the court if somebody actually did say something about the other parent? I mean, it's really hard, right? But people um, see that. They see the non-disparagement clause. Right. And they're like, but my the, my ex is saying all kinds of things. So I'm going to go back to the judge. And, and then we say, well, <clears throat> what do you think the judge is going to do? What are you going to well, ask the judge to do? Well, that's the thing. So that's why those, <laughs> the, that's why I call it aspirational. Because the, 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 what the, the agreements have to have are teeth in it. Right. And and you have to have teeth in your agreement for the things that actually do matter, you know, such as if they don't comply with certain um, 
parts of the agreement, right? So, and one of the things that I do, I, I, you just mentioned, and I, I do want to make sure I say, because I just had this conversation with actually somebody on my team yesterday. Uh, and, and that is, if you don't have a default provision for fees in your agreement, make sure that you do. If you haven't signed your agreement yet, because if you don't, it really is so much harder for you. And, and it really is a disincentive for them, uh, for sure. I mean, to to um, to to not comply. I mean, it, you, you know, you want them to comply. It, and, and if they if they think that they're going to have to pay not only their own fees, but your fees, too, if they default, it will incentivize them to want to comply with the agreement. Right. So, and, and, and so many so many people think they're covered when they put like may may be you know the the party that is that loses may be responsible for reasonable attorney's fees yeah well yeah. The, shall. no how about shall be shall. responsible for shall. actual attorney's yes. fees yes yeah. shall. i mean it's, the, it's still always going to be a reasonable this conversation anyway um just because that's the law but at least it it has to be awarded and 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 it doesn't give the judge that latitude of oh I, you know because a lot of judges are reticent to give fees but if it's contractual and it's in your MSA or in you know the the custody agreement or whatever it is it's in your state then the judge doesn't have the latitude to say no right and that's that single word like may versus shall. Mm -hmm. It can make all the difference. That's what made it easier for me to get the modification when I went back after the divorce on my own, pro se, because the language, that my attorney, I always say he put protective language in that said, if we find this out, then it shall be interpreted as this and shall trigger that. And it happened. But it, boy, it's a lot of arguing about it. But the judge said it says it right here. And make sure it, it's it a defaulting, defaulting party, not prevailing party, because mm. when it, because there's a big difference between they just defaulted and then they prevailed. Because when do they prevail, right? You know, when they've already gone out all the way to the Supreme Court for you know to to uh, to 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 uh, you know um, appeal it or whatever. I mean, you want to make sure that it's just all they did was default. Like, oh, that's good to know. Did they did they do what they said they were gonna? No, they didn't. Okay, they defaulted. Hmm. I just learned something. Thank you, Rebecca. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. You don't want to wait till they actually prevailed. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, your your original question had to do with after, right? After the agreements are in place, and I started to answer by saying, "Well, make sure this is in the agreement," which kind of skirted your question, and and your question was a really really important one. Because once you're out of the legal system, so many people feel this, okay, relief, like that's over. And it's really just starting. Not necessarily on the legal one. side. Divorce right? is part one. Just yeah, part one. Yeah. So there's so much that to, to be done uh, to combat the the other, the counter parents or the, the other side's um, attempts to undermine your relationship with your kids that doesn't involve the court. Where you were talking about disparagement before. So many of them are so good and so subtle in their undermining of your relationship with your children, that it it's not, hey, your dad's terrible. It's hey, like um, I think of an example from um, from my own situation. My older son uh, is a, played the you know the upright bass, that giant bass in orchestras, the huge huge instrument. And so one year for Christmas, I got him an electric bass, thinking how cool is that? Like he's got the skills. It's just you know, it's different. It's a different instrument, but how fun would that be to let him play like rock music and, and stuff like that? And his mother, um, from her own home, told him he's not allowed to use that bass until he achieves certain goals with his classical bass. So he didn't touch this Christmas present for two years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you do with that? I mean, that's her manipulating the child to take away a gift that I gave him for Christmas that was a special gift. And the courts like, can't do anything. Yeah. And there's lots. I have so many examples of stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, it's just just a little subtle way of 
uh, and she, oh, well, I was just trying to make sure that he had discipline, mm -hmm. I was just yeah. trying to make sure that he was learning and I, uh, what, what, <laughs> you know, and, and they just act all innocent. What do you have, you, have you met my ex? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's undermining the other parent's authority. And there's a, a well, number so of ways that happens. What? Yeah. I, I mean, you know, they're so good at that. So good at that. Yeah. Um, but, but that's the kind of thing that they do. And so what would you say, because I hear this question a lot about to a, a, a parent who is worried that their child is going to turn out narcissistic like the other parents. Mm, we hear that a lot too. We just did a whole webinar on, on this topic, the beginning of this topic. And that involved um, when you're, when your ex is putting poisonous messages into your kids' heads or trying to turn them against you, which we know often starts while you're still in the relationship, because with narcissists and people with personality disorders, there's that whole loyalty thing. Like you're with me or you're against me. So with kids after a divorce, it's, if you love me as your parent, then you need to hate or discard the other parent. So kids unfortunately get stuck in the middle and the toxic parent will do all, all kinds of things where they will reward certain behaviors and punish other behaviors. So we, we have a client who was telling us that her daughter would eavesdrop on her conversations with work. And um, she has a she has a good tip paying job and her daughter would report back to the father post-divorce. I think mom's making more money. And so the mom said, why are you doing this to her daughter? Why are you telling dad things like that? And the and the girl said, "Well, when I when I say bad things about you, mom, that's that's the only time he pays attention to me." So we have to remember that kids in these situations are victims of domestic violence themselves. They are being emotionally manipulated and they can appear like little narcissists and it is really scary. Um, but you have to remember that that often they're they're doing what's called fawning. They're trying to figure out a way to survive. We can separate from that person and live in our own place and get away from them. But the kids are the ones who still have to go back and forth. And so often they they learn what they have to do to function in each household. And sometimes they will take messages from the other parent and come back and say, dad said this about you or mom said this about you. And it can be very inflammatory and it can stir up all kinds of triggers because it's like they're doing the same behavior that my toxic ex did. And now I feel like I hate my kid. Like I'm, I'm there's like another little narc and what do I do? Um, and there's a lot that people have to do to learn to what's called self-regulate to figure out what their own triggers are to realize, okay, this is, this is a child. Um, there's a lot of other things going on just because they're behaving this way doesn't mean that they're a little narcissist, even though they're behaving like this, but there might be reasons for it. For example, your ex could be saying these things to your kids, asking to, to see what the kid says about your reaction to it. So basically baiting you by proxy. And so when you get inflamed, the kid goes back and says, oh, this is how my other parent reacted. And they get rewarded for that. Also, young kids and even teenagers learn um, a, a really bad dynamic, whereas they don't have a lot of control or agency in their own lives, especially as they're going back and forth between, uh, unfortunately, an unhealthy parent and sometimes a not very healthy parent either because of what's going on. And so when they say things and get you really upset, that gives them a sense of supply and a sense of power for negative behavior. So that's why it's really important to be as calm. And I know this is not easy and this involves a lot of work and is a much bigger conversation, but to be as calm as possible so that when they come at you and act like really inappropriately, you, you just are like, no, you know, that's not how you're going to talk to me. This is what we're going to do and act like, you know, kind of like learn to gray rock with your own kids where you don't let them get to you like that because it's it's feeding that same negative behavior. Remember, kids model their parents' behavior. So that child might be modeling what they see at the other home and thinking, oh, I can get away with it here. And unfortunately, a lot of parents, um, 
they they take it because they feel so guilty over the family not being intact anymore for a variety of reasons. And they're just like, oh my gosh, I don't want to lose my relationship with my kids. So I'm just going to give in or I'm going to tolerate it. Right? I don't see them very often. And it just goes into a really bad direction, but it's a big topic and it's a common fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So great answer. Thank you. So how do you guys help people? What's, what, what's your, the way that you guys help people? Chris, you want to start or should I keep talking? Sure. Well, <laughs> I mean, so people who come to us are usually already in the thick of it before they realize that they need the help. But there are some, so I'll, I'll talk from a practical standpoint. Um, there are about six areas that we really focus on the most. Um, and it, again, these are people who are usually in the legal system, usually like in the process of being worn down and bled dry. So we help them focus their um, their narrative around the things that actually matter, not going in and proving to the judge that the person's a narcissist or calling them abusive or focusing on the, their former partner's abuse of them. It's all about when we're talking custody, it's all about the, the children, right? It's all about what's best for the kids and the best interest factors and all that stuff. So it's it's documenting those things and, and honing their, their narrative in concert with their attorney, unless they're pro se. Um, how to communicate with their ex. Um, there's such a disconnect. We love when our clients have therapists to deal with all the trauma, trauma-informed therapist, but there's a disconnect between the, the therapeutic community and the legal system where a good therapist will say, well, cut off contact, no contact, right? That's the healthiest thing emotionally. I'd love to have been no contact with my ex for the last decade, but boy, that can undermine a custody case for sure. You don't respond to things. You don't involve them in decisions. If you happen to be the one who's who's making the decisions and you just cut them out, uh, that can feel really powerful, but a judge is not going to like that. They want to see you cooperating. So you have to appear to be cooperating. So you have to communicate the right way. Um, presentation, how to be a witness, how to deal with a bully attorney on the other side. They always hire bullies, right? Oh, you know? I always say that narcissists are like uh, owners and dogs. They always find an attorney that looks just yeah. like <laughs> I love that. I love that. That's a good one. Yep. Yeah. So it's it's whole presentation that extends to custody evaluators, attorneys for the children. We call them in New York or GALs. Those kinds of people they have that can have such a big say in how custody cases turn out. Um, so also having having strategic oversight of your case. Um, we don't work, we never want to work counter to an attorney. We all, we're all on, on our client's team, right? We're all pulling in the same direction, but only five to 10% of divorce cases are these especially high conflict ones, right? So most attorneys are, are like, wow, this is the craziest case I've ever seen. They don't follow the script. So uh, clients need to have a little bit more of a leadership role. My case didn't settle. I told, I mentioned mine took three years, cost $300,000. It didn't settle. Until I finally said no more with the negotiations, get a trial date, right? Get, I call it the splat date, right? You do, if you're a recreational, uh, if you jump out of planes, right? And a skydiver, there is a point after you've jumped out of a plane, here comes the earth, right? If you don't pull the ripcord, splat. So that, that trial date is your splat date, right? If you, I put, I put it in my do's and don'ts. I have a five page, um, uh, document that I it, that is in my slay program that I can I tell people to hand to their lawyers and in my do's and don'ts I I put in there do not send settlement proposals back and forth. Yes. Oh my gosh, you that's that is where a lot of my wasted yes. money went. A lot we spent if two are, years. If, if you are in uh, with a narcissist, that is the biggest waste of money of yes. all time mm -hmm. absolutely for both right. of looks like cases. we've got an agreement we're going to write it up and then nah i don't agree you oh, never. so many times yeah I, even if it's their own proposal and you spend like five days going back and forth oh it's not really what i, what I want but you know at least it'll be done like, okay fine we'll take it but by the time you get back oh well that deal is off the table because well I don't like yep. your face anymore. But but we're <laughs> going to use that as the starting point for new negotiations. I'm still yeah. at my original point, but that negotiated settlement is now your point. So now we're going to meet halfway of that. Yeah, because you took too long. Yeah. Um, whatever it is. 
but you know, and even though you went back and took every single point that they said, that deal is off the table. Yep, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, and then the other things is um, like reviewing parenting plans to look for that gray language, um, and then the biggest one is afterwards and being functionally co-parenting to the best of your ability day to day, uh, even after you're out of the legal system to help me, help me. I mean, all of us as parents, I think the goal is to raise kids who have the best chance at a healthy, happy life, Yeah, happy by whatever their definition is. Yeah. I mean, I do right. think it, you need a parenting coordinator or something like that. Um, if you have a narcissist on the other side, because you just don't want to have to keep going back to court all the time. Um, I do recommend that to people because there's always going to be something, you know, trick or treating or what, I don't know, just something. Some uh, sort of decision making mechanism that be, goes beyond the two of you just working it out, which is what the courts expect and never happens. Happen. Um, okay. Well, where can people learn more about you? Where can they get their your book? And how can they get in touch with you, follow you, all that good stuff? Super easy. Just been there, got out.com. Just search been there, got out. You'll see us on Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest. Uh, we have our book on Amazon. It's called been there, got out toxic relationships, high conflict divorce, and how to stay sane under insane cir circumstances. We are, st we just did a free webinar. We're starting to do um, courses on how to handle when your toxic ex starts turning the kids against you, both in and out of court. And that's the topic of the book we're working on now. Um, but yeah, just search for Been There, Got Out and you can find us really easily. Yeah, so go, go follow them, check them out, get their book, all that good stuff. Super good stuff. Really great people. And I just think that you guys are really doing some good work. So thank you for sharing your wisdom in the world and all the really good work that you're doing for people. Really, really love it. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Really appreciate it. Always wonderful talking with you.